News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. Well, hello, good day, and a warm welcome to Newsline. Today, Newsline has travelled all the way to the western part of England to find out all about why Britain is pulling out of the European Union. We travelled here um, at the invitation of our guest. In fact, we are guest today, Sir Hugo Swire. Sri Lanka is, uh, has a written down constitution <laughs> and in that constitution, uh, when it comes to serious matters uh, affecting uh, the national interest uh, or a matter of national issue, then uh, we have it written down that one needs a two-thirds, including uh, a two-thirds in Parliament and then a referendum of the people. Um, so, so we have that safeguard. Over here, you don't have that two-thirds. No, and we don't have a written constitution here. Our constitution is based on precedent and it evolves. And of course, Sri Lanka, uh, because of its painful recent history, has a series of other challenges. It has a series of other challenges going on, continuing in terms of the reconciliation between the, the different communities and also uh, after what was a painful, protracted civil war, it's important that that constitution is safeguarded and people have uh, confidence and uh, in the institutions and they must be as robust as possible. So I quite understand how Sri Lanka has got there. I'm not saying that the way we go about our democracy in the United Kingdom is a template for the way others do it. I'm just saying it's worked for us, but it's the people who are complaining are the people who don't like the fact that in that referendum the majority of the people voted to come out, so therefore they lost that referendum. And some people are still finding that very difficult to accept. Look at the new leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, Joe Swinson, who was asked as recently as about 10 days ago if in the event of a second referendum people still voted to come out, would she at that point accept uh, that? She said no. Well, what does that say for democracy? That basically says someone like that would only accept the answer if the answer concurred with what they believe in and what would they want. That's not democracy. Would it be fair to say that in Britain, politicians have failed, whereas business has uh, succeeded immensely? Well, I mean, that would always be the view of a businessman. And businessmen say the best thing that politicians can do is to keep out of business. Um, and uh, they've got a point. Uh, I think uh, you can look at anyone's political career, you can look at any government and actually uh, criticise it. But it's, this government's done some, some good things. We've radically reduced corporation tax. Um, the Thatcher government, of course, freed up all the state nationalised industries, which Mr Corbyn now wishes to to renationalize and uh, you, you saw the boom in the city of London. And look, at the end of the day, uh, the government is responsible for setting the parameters. It's then for business to get on and operate within those parameters and to generate the wealth we need. And, and, and people's, people's standards of living in this country are far, far higher than they've ever been. That's often forgotten, I think. But why, why gamble with all that? by leaving Europe. Well, you're presupposing that uh, leaving the European Union is going to be to our detriment economically. I just don't accept that premise. Why, why fix something that isn't broken? Well, I think most people in this country, or the majority of people who voted, felt that it was broken as far as the UK was concerned. Look, I would have always liked to have had some kind of country membership of the club, as it were, which we didn't take all the rules. And we, we're already outside mainstream Europe. We, we don't have Schengen, uh, we don't have the Euro, so we're already an awkward, uh, an awkward customer. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure we could have, if Merkel had... But immensely successful. Uh, uh, yeah, I, and one of the reasons I voted to remain is because I thought that the EU without the UK would be immeasurably weaker. And I think that's still the case. I mean, you know, if you look at the UK and the, the moderating influence it had in the corridors of power in Brussels and the kind of stability and common sense it brought to, to Europe, that was hugely important to the EU. And I think the EU is going to be far, far weaker uh, without the UK. And at the end of the day, who's going to benefit from that? With, with all this um, um, palaver, if you like, with all this consternation uh, going on yeah. uh, in Britain, uh, how does it leave um, trade agreements with uh, all these other countries? If you, once you're out of the uh, European Union, you're going to have to have agreements 
uh, with all these individual states. Yeah, I mean, I think the rule is that you can discuss these agreements, but you can't sign any of them yeah. until you're out of the EU. And of course, we're not out of the EU yet. So, so those people are saying you haven't signed a single trade agreement. Well, you can't actually sign one until we're out of the EU. But, but you can. That the problem, well, well, you can certainly set the parameters to sign them, and that's why I think uh, two things are are incredibly uh, important. One is I think if Trump is serious about doing an early trade agreement. Uh, with the UK that will send a good signal to the rest of the world um, and secondly I think the fact that uh, Boris Johnson's pulled together a cabinet of half a dozen ministers to actually um, get Brexit more ready than it's been we had a Chancellor of the Exchequer who was notably resistant to spend money on this and we're now going to have uh, clearly uh, you know a Chancellor and others who actually are determined to drive Brexit through um, then that's going to make all these things much easier I think. So amidst all this, uh, Sir Hugo, what does, where does Sri Lanka fit in? How does a country like Sri Lanka um, secure itself uh, with Britain, one of its most important trading partners? Well, I agree, and I was uh, visited Sri Lanka often, and I'm passionate for the UK to do more there. And particularly, I was concerned about the uh, influence of the Chinese. And uh, I think there are many opportunities for British businesses. Look, I'm currently the Deputy Chairman of the Commonwealth uh, Enterprise and Investment Council, and the remit of our little organisation is to drive trade within the Commonwealth. There's a, something called the Commonwealth Factor. It's 19% cheaper for one Commonwealth country to do business with another on account of common language, uh, common legal system, and so forth. Sri Lanka has been a key player in this organisation. So that shows to me that it wish wishes to engage with the rest of the Commonwealth and the UK and vice versa. Look, I always said, um, although when I was arguing to remain, um, but I've always said the whole way through, regardless of whether we're in the EU or outside the EU, and of course there is a difference because inside the EU we are bound by those trade agreements outside the EU, we have to strike our own trade agreements. But regardless, the United Kingdom has slightly been resting on its laurels in terms of trade over the years. We need to rediscover the pioneering ambition of our forebears and actually go to the far-flung corners of the world and strike these trade deals. Uh, and also, we talked about some of the challenges for the British economy, get many, many more of our SMEs, our small, medium-sized enterprises, to upskill, to learn actually that the, there is a market outside their own domestic market. And they need to actually get out to places like Sri Lanka, forge partnerships, joint ventures, whatever else it may be, and really you know, make international trade hum. I think we can do that. It requires a huge change in attitude. Um, you say that you were worried about uh, um, Chinese uh, yes. involvement of, uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, do you share the same uh, concern when uh, you hear that uh, the Sri Lankan government is, um, has signed uh, various agreements, one agreement in particular with the United States, and have run into a storm over the um, SOFA agreement, which is the uh, status of forces in, in, in our country. Um, um, do you, does that worry you too? Well, I think we are where we are. We know what happened in Sri Lanka in terms of uh, Sri Lanka's indebtedness towards China. Uh, we know China's the deal over the port and so forth in uh, Colombo and Hamantoto and so forth. And uh, there was, at some point, it did look as if there was a disproportionate uh, amount of Chinese I investment I in that country. Um, and we want plural investment in, in Colombo, and certainly that's a view shared by the Indians, incidentally, and in your neighbouring Maldives as well, who are slightly in the same category. So I don't think any one country uh, should be reliant, over-reliant on any one other country for its trade, its debt and its investment. So that's why I hope the whole idea of uh, Colombo establishing itself as a centre uh, in the uh, road for, from between Dubai and Hong Kong as a centre of financial excellence and so forth, which is one of its ambitions, would be hugely good. But uh, Sri Lanka needs to up its game as well in terms of making it easier for British companies to do business there. Uh, I was going to ask, that was going to be my uh, question to you, how do you, what does Sri Lanka have to do to endear itself to more British investment? Not, not just trading, but a presence in, uh, in the country of uh, bigger British businesses in Sri Lanka 
uh, to, to encourage all these other sort of things that we speak about. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And there are far too many infrastructure projects, for instance, which British companies are not even bidding for. So I think we, we're both at fault. We've got to create an easier climate and a more transparent climate in uh, Sri Lanka uh, for British businesses to take advantage of. And we've got to bring those opportunities to British businesses to show that they are actually there and they're viable. Well, whilst you um, are talking about uh, promoting democracy and equality in, in everything, um, a level playing field if you like, does it, um, as the former minister in charge of the Commonwealth actually, does it uh, bother you, concern you, that in Sri Lanka the provincial elections have been delayed for over two years? Well, I think there are a lot of things which are of concern to me in uh, Sri Lanka, not least the progress on the reconciliation, uh, the army giving up uh, a lot of its land. It has done, uh, particularly in the north around Jaffna, but it could do a lot more. But I think we need to recognise the fragility of politics uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, we need to understand the uh, divisions between the uh, presidency and the prime minister uh, and then the opposition and we need to recognize the fact that Sri Lanka is still emerging uh, from the aftermath of a very bloody civil war. So my real concern about Sri Lanka is that there should be, should be no going back uh, to the, what we saw 10 years ago plus. And, uh, but in terms of economic regeneration I think there's a long way to go, uh, not least in the balance between the south and the north and the east. Um, and having more devolved power, but ultimately that's up to the people of Sri Lanka, but certainly uh, there should be elections and that's what a democracy is all about. If you, uh, when um, uh, Prime Minister then David Cameron uh, visited Sri Lanka in the north, um, he was met by large crowds of people yeah. who were basically complaining that uh, their lot in life hadn't been uh, seen to in terms of the accountability, uh, missing people yes. and so on. Um, if you were to travel to Sri Lanka now, uh, it would probably be the same in the north. Uh, they, they will still have the same complaint, although the government uh, has changed. And so, as far as they're concerned, nothing has changed. Um, and when they look to you uh, in Britain, uh, with its large um, Sri Lankan diaspora here, um, what do you have to say to them? Well, a, a large amount of that Sri Lankan diaspora, as you describe them, are of course Tamil Indeed. and come from that uh, part of the world. Yeah. And uh, I, I tell you what I say to them, which is not universally popular. I've said rather than sending money back to your relations in Jaffna and the north, um, you should establish businesses there. Look, th these Tamil diaspora in the UK run all the garages and the rest. they're hugely entrepreneurial. They're mm -hmm. great for the British economy, but th they should be investing more in their own country as well, rather than sending money back. And I just don't buy in. When I said that when I was a minister, I got incredible criticism for encouraging people to go back to this dangerous part of the world where white man disappearances do were still happening. Do you personally think that Sri Lanka is a dangerous place? No. I think there are challenges, not from uh, other Sri Lankans, but I think there has been obviously infiltration from extremists, as there has been all over the world. How can I sit here in the UK and talk about what happened in Sri Lanka when we had Manchester bombings, when you saw what happened in London. Th th this is a disease which is global now. Uh, well, if your question is, does Sri Lanka have security threats from extremists? Yes. Does the UK? Yes. Do most countries? Yes. If your question is, does Sri Lanka have threats from its own communities in the same way that it did before? I don't believe that to be the case. So would you rather have Sri Lanka in its purest sense uh, uh, as it was before, a uh, totally non-aligned nation? No, I'd like Sri Lanka to be a totally uh, aligned in terms of its democratic aspirations, the way it behaves, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased it's uh, playing a prominent role again uh, within the Commonwealth. Don't forget we had the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Colombo only a few years ago. It's worth remembering some of what the Commonwealth Charter says about tolerance, behaviour, transparency, democracy, anti-corruption. And I think anyone who is a member of the Commonwealth uh, should actually reread the Commonwealth Charter on a regular basis and mark themselves as to how well they're doing. Um, we have some, uh, on our programme, we, we, we take questions and uh, before this recording, uh, we, we did take some questions uh, okay. from uh, our database uh, of viewers. And one of these was uh, to do with Sri Lankan students. Yeah. Um, 
it's this uh, back to the same thing that uh, Britain uh, appears to only want the richer, uh, the more uh, economically uh, better off, uh, stu even students uh, in this country. And the reason they, they, this question is, they say that uh, with the many restrictions to students in Sri Lanka, in terms of from Sri Lanka and other countries, uh, the restrictions uh, restrict their ability to work. It's only a, a, a yes. small amount of hours, and with the with the rising costs of uh, uh, education and so on, that um, it sort of leaves some of them back. I can assure you, Sri Lanka is not alone in in being concerned about the rights of students to work, uh, either directly after they've completed their degree or during. We've had the same issues from. Australia and New Zealand in particular, that is an issue. Look, I, I think anyone should be able to come here uh, to study. It's ridiculous m for them not to. We have some of the best universities in the world, and if people have a good experience in the UK, it means they're going to be warm towards the UK, hopefully for the rest of their lives, and that's hugely important. When I was a minister in the Foreign Office, we had a the Chevening Scholarship Programme, which brings students from all over the Commonwealth, including, uh, I'm glad to say, uh, Sri Lanka. I increased the funding of that hugely, and we increased the amount of students from around the Commonwealth, uh, indeed from around the world, hugely as well. There's a Commonwealth Scholarship Programme uh, as well. So I think we're doing everything we can, but as I said earlier, in an answer to one of your earlier questions, uh, I think it's ridiculous to count student numbers in any census because these are a transitory population. Mm. But look, we've got big universities, they've expanded hugely over the last 10 years. Um, they're fueled really by tuition fees, which I think uh, the government are going to now reduce. That's going to leave a lot of these universities with uh, an economic headache. And my suspicion is that they will be filling a lot of those places from overseas students. Uh, and another question from, uh, uh, from our uh, database of viewers is again to do with the North. Um, the, the question is that has Britain sort of um, taken a softly, softly approach in terms of uh, that accountability process that uh, uh, for the North, the, the allegations yeah, yeah. of the various allegations yeah. of uh, look, look, it was uh, look, it was a, it was a, it was a horrible period in any country's history. Um, the civil war and uh, the aftermath, it, it was extremely difficult for a lot of people. Um, and I've been to the north and I've been s on more than one occasion, I think, to the, to the north and spoken to people there. Um, but I, I don't think it's dangerous anymore, the north. And I, I alluded earlier to the fact that I thought the government could do more to release more of the military land and so forth to local people. So there's more we could do. We were very involved in mine clearing, I remember, when I was a minister. But I'm not responsible now. Mm. Uh, politically as the minister, but I used to go to Geneva. I used to hold uh, the Sri Lanka government's feet to the fire in terms of fulfilling on the obligations and the undertakings it had made. Do you think there's, a, there's an element of using that some uh, unsavory elements perhaps uh, use this, this uh, perceived threat when now it, it, there isn't such a threat? I, I'm not going to... There's a complicated issue around um, immigration and people uh, claiming that they are uh, fleeing from uh, persecution all over the world and I think sometimes uh, those cases need to be looked at on an individual basis. Um, Sir Hugo Swire, um, thank you for being um, ever so uh, uh, open and uh, sort of uh, uh, hopeful for the future. Um, so in that context, do you think the United Kingdom will be more prosperous uh, by leaving the European Union? Uh, I don't see why not. Um, uh, of course, there's tremendous debate about how much of the famous 39 billion uh, we will have to pay to the EU for this uh, divorce. Uh, the Prime Minister is fairly certain it won't be anything like that figure, and that will enable us to spend more money domestically. But what's absolutely certain is that when we come out of the cosy arrangement we had with the EU, where uh, most of our foreign trade, all of our foreign trade, uh, basically, was handled through the instruments of the EU, we're going to be on our own, and that is a threat, it's also a huge opportunity. Uh, we are traders, we're an island race, we controlled at one point, uh, two thirds of the world was painted red for the British Empire, that's not because we sat here bemoaning uh, our luck on this uh, rocky outcrop of rocks bobbing up and down in the North Sea, it's because we actually got out there, went around the world, went to some strange far distant places, struck up relationships, made trading agreements, uh, and the result was for everyone to see. Let me give you an example of this. 
until the Second World War, uh, Latin America's biggest trading partner was the United Kingdom. Uh, since the Second World War, for a whole host of reasons, our trade in Latin America is truly woeful. Uh, that's one market we can rapidly engage in. They long for British know-how, they long for British technology, they long for British luxury goods, and that's replicated around the world. I used to go travel incessantly in my four and a half years uh, at the Foreign Office, uh, and I was absolutely amazed by the constant demand for British know-how, as I say, be it uh, on governance, uh, be it to do with the city regulation, on privatisation, but also a thirst for British branded products. I don't think we've even started on this journey and I think it's hugely exciting. And will it be up to uh, business to put the great back in Britain? I think Britain, the <laughs> I think, well, I think Britain is a great place anyway if you look at our tradition of democracy, if you look at our uh, uh, unequaled uh, tourist attractions, our beautiful countryside. Hopefully you think you're in the middle of that uh, during this interview. Indeed. And uh, if you look at our music, we have the best music in the world. Uh, I would argue we have incredible fashion, we have great theatre and cinema, we have extraordinarily good uh, television programmes, we have the wonderful institutions, be they our military or our royal family respected around the world. We, and overcapping it all, we have uh, a parliamentary democracy which has its tensions, but on the whole, works pretty well with the devolved assemblies in Northern Ireland, Wales uh, and Scotland. So I think Britain is a great country. Um, I think it is a great country, but I think it can be greater. And that greater will be created by whom? By the politicians or by British it, it, It's for the government to set the parameters for the business community and others to thrive within. And we should leave them with no excuse at the end of all this, but to up their game, to make it easier for them to go about increasing the wealth of all this country. Because if you're a basic conservative like I am, uh, what underpins your entire philosophy is that a rising tide lifts all ship. There can be no alleviation of poverty for the very poorest without the generation of money uh, by the more successful. And if you're that famous phrase of one nation Tory, which everyone now claims to be, uh, I believe in the uh, unfettered right of people to create wealth to pass on that wealth to whoever they deem. Equally, it is inherent on those people to pay and to support those less well off in society. You can only do that if they're making money. If you look at the last three years or so, uh, it appears that uh, politicians have failed, but business has succeeded. Can the world trust um, British politicians to make uh, the decisions that will have far-reaching international ramifications? Yes, I hope so. I think what's never worked, it's very interesting if you review uh, British politics, even over a century, or certainly half a century, is how few businessmen who have moved into politics have made a success of politics. Uh, how few people have moved from politics to business, equally it's not a very high number, which suggests to me there is a difference between being a businessman and a woman or, and a politician. But what is certainly true is we need to increase the amount of people who have business experience, particularly entrepreneurial experience, within the House of Commons. I think the House of Commons, over the last 10, 15 years, I've been there for almost 20 years, and I've seen, I think, a reduction, if you like, in the amount of members of parliament who have an experience of the commercial world. We've got lots of social workers, doctors, teachers, and so forth. We need many more people who understand that the economic engine room of the country, which turns the wheel around, are the family-owned businesses, the small, medium-sized uh, enterprises, and the government must do uh, everything it can to get out of their way. So you go, I've, got, I've got one question about, um, uh, it's about, the, about the same, and this is this. Uh, we, are, we spoke about uh, a small number of people uh, in comparison to the total voting um, population um, voted to uh, move out of the EU. Sure. In the same context, and with the election of the Prime Minister of this country. Um, you know, uh, the, the Conservative Party <coughs> membership chose this Prime Minister. They've, they've, they've done this previously too. What, what is the rule on that? Well, the, the, the rule is that actually what happened has just happened, that the person, if, if there's a transference of power when you've got an incumbent government, uh, that doesn't automatically trigger a general election. You then have your own party election, and uh, not only has Boris Johnson become leader of the Tory party, he's de facto become uh, prime minister because we are the government uh, in power at the moment. 
but um, let me see here we go. The, the surely when somebody is voting, uh, you, you uh, if you look at if you follow the campaign, you'll see that it's the party leader who is leading the campaign. Sure, but we're not a presidential uh, system. We don't have a presidential system here. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a prime minister who primus inter pares, first amongst equals, yeah. who comes from the body politic of the party who can form uh, the government. And that's what's happened with Boris. I just point out that actually, yes, the membership of the party voted overwhelmingly for Boris Johnson, yeah. but so did the membership of the House of Commons vote overwhelmingly for Boris Johnson. So he's got a huge endorsement, both from his parliamentary colleagues as well as members in the country. Now, if you compare and contrast that to the situation you have with the Labour Party, where Jeremy Corbyn was foisted uh, on the parliamentary party by the members, and you can see the resulting unhappiness. I think that puts us in a very good position that actually the majority of people in Parliament, the majority of people who are subscribing members of our party, all wanted Boris Johnson. It's up to him now to show that the faith placed in him has been well placed. So Hugo, thank you very much for having invited us. We've actually today, uh, we've been your guest. Uh, usually our guest is our guest, but uh, uh, thank you uh, to inviting us, uh, for inviting us. And, thank you for uh, coming. And beautiful surroundings, much more uh, prettier than our studio, <laughs> which is under reconstruction. Thank you very much. We've uh, much enjoyed uh, being here and listen to what you have to say. And that's the way it was on uh, Newsline today. And thank you for watching and uh, take care. And of course, God bless. Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali.